Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. By American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. By Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. By Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. By RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. And by New Home, changing the way America sews. Hi, I'm glad you're back with us today because today's show is a really special one to me. We're going to be talking about how people are helping other people in their own way with quilts. And you might want a paper and pencil because we'll give you a con some addresses that you can jot down for how you can contact some of these helping groups we'll tell you about in just a little bit. You know, making quilts to help other people isn't new. There's a long tradition of it in quilt making. When people try to help other people, they do it in whatever way they can. For 19th century women, it was often hard to get control of the purse strings to give money, so they gave what they could, and that was usually their time and their skills, especially their skill at needlework. They made quilts and gave them away to soldiers and the needy, and they sold their quilts to raise money for causes they believed in. Their delicate stitches bought both guns and bandages during the Civil War. It helped support the Underground Railroad, kept the suffragette banner flying, and it certainly re-roofed many a church. Here's an historic quilt now in the Missouri Historical Society's collections that I think is really wonderful. It was made by women in a Missouri church group to raise money to help needy families right after the Civil War. You can see it's a log cabin quilt that's made from silk dresses. At the center of each block, it's got a golden butterfly, and those were cut from a dress that were donated by the minister's wife. Across the quilt center, they ran their message, and it sparkles in brass sequins. I've never seen sequins on such an early quilt. It says, Feed the Hungry. This quilt raised $206 for their cause. One woman's society in Arizona even claimed to have made a quilt every other day for a three-year period. And we think we're busy, right? Well, you can help, and we're going to tell you in a minute. But we're also going to show you how to make this block, the pine tree, which was a symbol in Ohio of the temperance movement. This scrap sampler is by Mary Helen Schwinn. And we are going to have the pine tree block as our very last block in our sampler today. I'm just crazy about the pine tree. It has real special feelings because at Christmas time I bring out my pine tree quilt and it's just so fun to have it. I remember that one. It's really a gorgeous one. The pine tree is special for me because, well, I love to go camping with my family. We like the out of doors and it just brings up all those memories of being outside with them. And, you know, even my husband really likes this block. And I've heard that a lot of men seem to, have, it appeals to them. So if you've got that special man in your life, don't forget about this block pattern. The block, the students, worry just a little bit about it because they want to always put it on point it. Mm -hmm. because it is of course straight in mm -hmm. the sampler but if you look at the quilt in the back here you can see that it's on point and it has strips going and so when you make your full quilt you can put it on point and that's right and today we're going to show you how to make the block we'll be covering some techniques that are familiar with you already and we'll do some drafting and putting it together and then we'll share the pine tree quilt with you that's right let's get started with the shapes though up for the drafting. You notice here that we have some branches and a background area that is really a little complicated so we all, we're going to have to draft those out. Notice that this is an 8 inch block and if you'll come over to your graph paper and let's mark uh, 8 inch square. Divide your 8 inch square into half and that's 4 inches and just put a little dot all the way around. Now for the base of our pine tree, connect on a diagonal 
the two lines. Now we have a base. Now let's come over and start our branch. If you will lay your ruler in half and come over two inches and stop and then come the other half down here and draw up two inches and stop, now we can just put a diagonal line and make our branch uh, shape here. All right, let's go back down here to our base and come over one inch, come in one inch, a dot, and let's get our trunk going on here. There we go. And a little bit more there. <laughs> Now we have this background shape that I was concerned about. <laughs> it's all made. Let's go put now with our red pen, put a um, quarter inch seam allowance all the way around. Now notice that the two shapes go into each other. Let's just take a dotted line and that just helps me to keep straight on this. So now I'm ready to make a template right. out of it. Right, And you can do that by laying a piece of template plastic right over your drafted pattern and you'll remember that you want to trace around the shapes right over the red lines and then cut them out and take a look here. Can you see I've marked on this shape it says branches 12 inch pine tree block and there's one more indication which is an arrow and this is real important for cutting. We'll show you in just a minute how it's used. And the second shape that we drafted was this background piece and it says cut one and cut one reverse. Now that may be a little different than we've done before. So I want to show you how it fits into the diagram here. See? Now there's another one just like it on the other side, but it's mirror image, so I'm flipping the template over, which means on my fabric, I need to cut these so that the right sides are together. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you can just fold your fabric right sides together, but you also need to check and see where the grain line is. Mm -hmm. Notice the lengthwise grain doesn't stretch at all, but the crosswise grain does give some stretch. So since this is marked, we will lay it on and take our permanent pen and mark the outline of that, and then we can take our quick cutting tools and cut this out. Now, be sure that when you use a permanent pen that uh, it's important because we wouldn't want this to bleed or, or rub through if, even if we're steam pressing oh, it. That would be terrible. Here's the branch there. Mm -hmm. We can just lay our branch, the straight line, grain line, and we only cut one of these, so we've got that ready right. now. Right. Let's take a look at how these shapes fit into the diagram. Here's the branch section. Now look at these. These are the two background shapes, like this. Okay. Now to complete that unit, you have a triangle, a uh, triangle, that's a rectangle, for the trunk. And that one you can quick cut. It's uh, 3 and 3 eighths by 4 and 3 fourths. And finally the base is a triangle cut from a 4 and 7 eighths inch square and you can cut that in half diagonally which will give you straight grain around the edge of your block. Mm -hmm. Real important. Real important. Um, there are a couple other shapes in this block which are these squares. These are cut two and a half inches and there are two more in the corners. And then the half square triangles, which is a technique that we've covered before in previous lessons, but these are made by cutting two and seven eighths inch wide strips from each of these two fabrics. Now see that I have joined these four little shapes together in the corner. This is a real good starting point because mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to get these little uh, units twisted around. So let's take a look. at. You can see here that the shapes are ready now to be sewn together. And I put the corner up here and I notice the two half square triangles will come in together here and this will come together forming this little butterfly. If you'll come down and see this little butterfly helps me keep straight the direction in which the triangles need to go. Notice this butterfly goes down this way. Mm -hmm. And that's just one little clue that helps me to see that it's right. Now we're ready to sew this together. Okay, take a look at the trunk section here. We're going to construct that first and I've laid out all of the shapes in the order in which they'll be sewn. Take the trunk and place it right sides together with one of the background shapes and then stitch right from the edge and stop one quarter of an inch from the edge. Now you may be able to just judge that or eyeball that distance by now, but if you need a little help, then you go ahead and put a dot there. 
take a look here. I have an example that's already been sewn. And stitch, stop, quarter of an inch. And then I've sewn the other background shape on just the same way, stitching and stopping a quarter of an inch. Now let's add the, uh, the branch section. Can you see how it fits together here? It looks like you just might be able to zip right around that, but it's real important that you do this in three separate steps. I have creased a center fold uh, on both of the shapes, and then I am going to secure it with a pin. Can you see here the previous stitching lines? This tells me where to start and where to stop, and I will stitch right between the stitching lines. And then I'm going to turn this unit and secure Let's secure these edges and let me fold this so you can see. Stitch from the edge, stop right at that stitching line and you'll do the same thing on the other side. Let me open it up and show you a completed one here. Okay, oops, we forgot to put this um, base on. The base is the last thing that goes on to this unit. And um, remember how we put the centerfold. You put that little centerfold in there, and then you match them up and stitch all the way across. Give this unit a good final press, and we're ready to put it into the block. Mm -hmm. We sure are. We've got a piece waiting here for this other one to join together. Let's turn it a little bit for them. There we go. Okay. So there we go down, and it's together. And then these two units have been sewn together, so this just comes over, and now we've got this wonderful block. Isn't that great? Yes, oh. it is. Makes it look and so this easy. this is our pine tree quilt that we've been <laughs> waiting to show you and share with you. That's right. Look at the center pine tree and the space that we were talking about, the wonderful quilting. Mm -hmm. Claire Jarrett uh, did the quilting design for this, and uh, the alternate block, I think, is really, really Oh, wonderful. wonderful. And look at, you know how to do this already. Look at all these strips of fabric and how they meet together in the corner to form this wonderful 25 patch. Oh. And the same design is quartered and put up here in the corner. We know you'll just love this quilt. So get it all ready next week. We'll sew all the blocks together. Some people find quilts a perfect way to get a message across. I love this quilt that I'm going to show you that's by Jean Ray Laurie. Jean's from Clovis, California. And when she heard of the speech, that was given for the Optimist Club in Little Rock, Arkansas. She knew those words would just speak for themselves if she just put them on a quilt. I'll tell you what we do up here in Perry County when one of our women starts poking around in something she doesn't know anything about. We get her an extra milk cow. And if that don't work, we give her a little more garden to tend. And if that's not enough, we get her pregnant and keep her barefoot. The next two quilts I wanted to show you were ones that I saw in an exhibition that was curated by Carla Friedlich. Carla's from the Museum of American Folk Art, and she had a wonderful show called Quilts of Conscious. Two of the quilts that really made an impression upon me are ones I'm going to show you now. One is called Home Sweet Home. It was done by Canadian quilt maker Wendy Lewington Coulter. From far away, it looks just like a charming traditional house quilt, but look closer and you see the message that Wendy stamped onto the lattice strips. She's pointing out the difference between the ideal and the real here. The reality, according to Canadian statistics, is that one out of 10 Canadian women is battered. Wendy writes, by juxtaposing these horrifying facts with row upon row of neat little calico houses, I hope to create a metaphor for the problem of domestic violence. The other quilt that made a big impression on me that was from that same Quilts of Conscious show was one by Jennifer Regan. Jennifer was very impressed when she saw a photography exhibition from the Regent Hotel, which is a homeless women's hotel, and poems written by those women. So she wanted to make a quilt that was based upon that homeless hotel. And that's the name of her quilt. Jennifer's a Cambridge, Massachusetts artist, and she began to feel a real identity with homeless women she saw everywhere in the streets of New York. She made her homeless women hotel based on these photographs and the poems that they wrote. So each block in her quilt is a hotel room. Jennifer writes, the comforting metaphor of the quilt 
and the cartoon figures I use, the bright colors somehow make me dare to sew my dark messages. The next quilt I wanted to show you has kind of an interesting story. What happened was I had called a New York gallery asking them for slides of a particular work which I'll be using on another show. And the woman that answered the phone said yes, she had the slides and she'd be glad to send them. And then as we were talking, she said, well, you know, I al also made a quilt. And so I said, tell me a little bit about it. And she mentioned that she had made it with a homeless man. And so I asked her to tell me more about it and to send me slides of it. The name of the quilt is Merryweather, which is a really nice name for the quilt because it's made with umbrella silks. The woman's name is Suzanne Kreps. When she first began working at the gallery, she met a homeless man who only wants us to identify him as Robert. He'd once been in a show at the gallery before he'd had a breakdown and had begun living on the streets. And one day when he was in the gallery, he asked Suzanne if she had any mending. She remembered then these umbrella silks that she'd inherited and she began laying them out in a quilt form and Robert began sewing them up by hand. They gave him a small room off the gallery to work in and five months later, Merryweather was finished. Suzanne writes of the quilt and its effect on them both. She says, it's as if the work has helped to partially heal him. It's given him something to focus on and to look forward to doing. And the same can be said for me. There's only so much I can do for Robert. People have tried to get him an apartment and it just hasn't worked. The most I can do for him is to keep the projects coming, pay him what I can, and maybe most importantly, to be his friend. So what can you do if you are really concerned about some of the problems today, and it seems sometimes like we have so many problems, you might be wondering what quilts have to do with this. But there are two groups that are really asking for your help and have thousands of people all over the country that are quilt makers that are making quilts for them. One is the Helping Hands Quilt Project, and this is one of the quilts from that project. What they ask, they give quilts to homeless people, to women in battered shelters. They ask that you make one block with a hand, just outline your hand and, and applique it on. You can use a machine, you can use any way of attaching it that you want, and then put a label so you're identifying it as a Helping Hands quilt. They said, don't worry about your stitching. This is a perfect way to use old materials that you have. You can hand quilt it, you can tie it, anything that you want, and they will be delighted to have it. Another project I wanted to tell you about is ABC Quilts. They're in Northwood, New Hampshire. We'll give you both of these addresses, and they give baby quilts to AIDS babies, to babies that are abandoned, and so they would like any kind of quilt that you can make Make sure it's safe, no pins. If you do tie it, double knot it, and just make it very secure for those, those babies. Now we go to Rod. When I told him what the theme of this show was, he said he would try to find us a red and white fundraising quilt. I couldn't find a red and white quilt for you, but my mother went into her cedar chest oh. and brought out a quilt that my great-grandmother and grandmother worked on together. It's a Dresden plate. It's really nice. Had you seen this before you brought it out of the cedar closet? Well, my mother took it out of her cedar chest. I, I think I'd seen it one time before, but I actually I'd really forgotten about uh -huh. it. Um, this is a quilt that my maternal grandmother and great grandmother, we called Mamie, pieced together. And my mother can pick out fabrics from her dresses, her sister oh. Helen's dresses. Um, again, it, it, it's typical fabric from the 1930s when my grandmother made it. It's just a real gem of fabrics. And it, it's got a lot of the same, those pastels that mm -hmm. we looked at in the um, grandmother's flower garden in the, the scalp border. This was a very typical common border in the 30s. Um, I love the quilting in here, the way they're echoing those Dresden plate shapes in the feather wreaths. A Mrs. Grossman, who was a neighbor, quilted it for, for my grandmother. And that was really common in the 30s and 40s that there were women that did it professionally mm -hmm. um, or a church's ladies' aid society would do it. 
there were Amish women that were quilting for the English, the non-Amish. Now, was this people. made in Indiana too? I know in your Huntington, whole family. yeah, in Huntington, yeah. Indiana, and it's it's really special. I mean, it's it's very sentimental to me <laughs> um, to have a quilt that you know my relatives made. Do you remember them seeing them work on? I quilts? never did. No, uh -huh. this my grandmother really didn't quilt after she was a seamstress she sewed and and mended all of the family clothes would that have but, been how she had access to so many because the, this just has so many prints well you know a lot of these prints are from feed sacks oh, and really? that was used a lot well i've the heard of that but how do you tell the difference between well feed sacks i can't i don't know if i can pick out you know just which one exactly? I think some of the more plain ones, maybe like this, or or one over here. Um, I've seen examples of feed sacks, of the printed sack, but just so many of these quilts of this era contain fabrics that were from those sacks. So feed sacks don't necessarily mean it says, you know, Acme's feed oh, no, or anything. No. They're in prints. There are quilts, of course, that they left the, that printing yeah. on. I'm using one in my book, uh -huh. actually. We're here now with Susie Shy, who with her husband Jimmy Accord makes some fantastically complex quilts. You'll get some ideas that you can use in your own work and she's also going to show you quilts from the Green Quilt Movement and tell you how you can become involved. She's already working on something. What are you doing? Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a sketch of you. <laughs> We won't see that. No. <laughs> I've asked you to kind of give us an idea of how you work and what, what new work are you working on now? What's one of your latest quilts so we can get an idea of what a finished quilt looks like? Well, the Healing is a green quilt that we made um, earlier this year, and it's about sending out good energy to heal the whole earth. Um, it's part of the green quilt movement, and it's got a message on it that says, we are seeing the healing of the earth before our very eyes. And it's meant to heal everything from cancer, which has been a big part of our experience with our friends this year, um, onto the environment, the animals. It's all tied in together. So, um, Your quilts are always really spiritual, but you go through so many steps. Let me show, I wanted you to show me, when I look at a finished quilt of yours, I have no idea how it got to be. You can't tell by looking at them. So you've got kind of stages in your work here. Well, this is, this is a, an overall simplified version of the stages, and they never stay the same, but this is one way, drawing with a permanent marker on the fabric freehand. So this is your base layer? Just yes, this? drawing with that. And then it's painted with a permanent fabric paint, and it's heat set by ironing it wearing a respirator mm -hmm. so you don't get fumes. Mm -hmm. It's pinned to a padding and a backing before it's sewn. And then you start to embellish it? And then we start with sewing. Um, sometimes we do machine sewing and Jimmy helps me a lot with that. He's really good with freehand embroidery and I do a lot of hand sewing. What is this kind of, this looks like metallic thread. That's this lovely stuff that we found this year that's a, a hand sewing thread that's a metallic Lame. It's very nice. Oh, it's, it's gorgeous. Then we're getting more and more complicated. Then this, we have, is this glitter? Yeah, that's a glitter paint. We don't use it real often, but it makes a nice effect. It's uh, meant to be used on fabrics for your clothes and things like that. You can buy it at the fabric store. Is it washable? Yeah, it's washable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to iron that. That's really nice. And this addition is a squirt bottle paint. I don't know what else to call it, but they use that on clothes a lot too. And this is washable too? It's washable. You can't it's iron. Once texture. you get this stage, uh -huh. you cannot iron it any longer. So okay. you can't add any more paint Just when we point. thought you couldn't add more embellishment. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the beads. Oh, I want to see that box Okay, here's the beads. Okay, I am dying to see this quilt because it's only partially done. Let me flip this. Is this a green quilt here? Yes, it is. It's called The World of the Wondrous. And you and Jimmy have got this, what, halfway done? Yeah, this is really still just a base layer. Um, there'll be a lot of things going over this oh, layer. It's wonderful. What else do you put on? 
Well, it looks for instance, to me almost like it's done, but you've got these little. Yeah, pants. I've made thirty some of these, um, and there'll be a lot more. This kind of thing. And, and Jimmy's leather work. And Jimmy's leather work. These pieces are not painted yet; they're just drawn and tooled on the leather. I was thinking, this one would go on that side, facing in at the top. It, then. And there'll be another one on this side. And then a green quilt label. Tell mm -hmm. me about the green quilt movement and how people well, can become involved in it. This started in 1989. Um, I decided I had to do something that would be environmentally helpful with my artwork. And I thought it would be really nice to get other people who are interested in to do the same thing. It's a very grassroots thing. There's no, there's no uh, formal rules or anything. You just make a quilt with an affirmative statement for the earth, thinking positively mm -hmm. for it. Um, you put a label on the back. You can either buy these from the address. Well, there's two addresses that we'll have. One is mine to get information about the, the project, and another is Robin Schwab, who is in New York and silk screens the labels, but you can put on your own label, too. You don't have to buy a 50-cent label. There's hundreds of people around the world now making green quilts, and there have been a couple of green quilt exhibitions, but the quilts can be shown anywhere. They can be any type of quilt, and they can be any kind of statement as long as it's positive. And I'm really impressed with how many people have really um, responded so well to it. And it keeps me kind of busy. It's, sometimes it's hard to find time for my own work. So, um, oh, and they, they should send slides of their work so we have a historical record of it. But I really enjoyed it. I'm really thrilled that so many people care so much. I hope we've given you lots of ways that you can become involved in the Green Quilt Movement or in any of the other movements that help people. Please be with us next week, and thanks for being with us now, and thank you, Susie. Thank you, Penny.